Good morning. I'm Tricky Lopa, co-founder of Art Fair Philippines, and I would welcome you. I would like to welcome you to day three of Art Fair Philippines series of talks. Um, and day three of this exciting um, series of sessions put together in collaboration with Jay Studio. And we'd also like to um, acknowledge our education partners for our talks program, the Ateneo Art Gallery, Museum Foundation of the Philippines, and the Embassy of Spain in the Philippines. Just a few reminders. To ensure the smooth transmission of the demonstration, the audio function will be limited to the moderator and speakers. We encourage everybody to please type in your questions at the Q&A box, and I will read them to you at the, end of, um, at the end of the video presentation. But if you want to ask your questions live, click the raise hand icon and we will unmute you. So welcome to Conversations on Clay Segment 3, The Life of the Potter, Life of a Potter. And we are very excited to have our two guests with us today. To tell you more about them will be our, will be our curator, Pablo Capati III. But let me welcome Pablo first. It was in 1989 in Kobe, Japan, when Pablo K. Capati III first learned pottery, taking up ceramics at 13 years old. His interest remained as he went on to pursue higher learning in USC, where he took a course in alternative firing techniques in 1996. In 2000, he resurrected this interest initially as a hobby and finally established his studio in San Jose Batangas in 2003. So please, I would like to welcome Pablo to join me here. Hi, Pablo. It's been a great Hi, three days you. for me. So thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, um, uh, it's been really fun the past few days and uh, even going to get better because we got two very special guests today. Okay. So let I me will, introduce, let me introduce them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Pablo Capati III. Uh, welcome to Conversations on Clay. This is our third and last segment to complete the full circle. We were gonna, we're gonna, our topic would be a potter's life. For today, we have very, very special guests, rarely, rarely uh, together. And um, let me introduce the first, Sir John Petty John. Sir John um, spearheaded stoneware high firing in the 70s. And since then, it's been continue um, making pots with his wife, Tessie Petty John, and they're based in Laguna. <clears throat> John, John I would, I'm very proud to say that John is one of my mentors that helped me pursue pottery and um, create what I've been able, been able to create today. Thank you, John San. Next is my good friend, Kuya Joey De Castro, my number one critic and number one travel body all over the Philippines and other parts of the world. Kuya Joey has his, um, he, he was one of the first potters that had a studio in the city, in the middle of, well, the center of EDSA in Mandaluyong. Uh, his, his career initiated with his love for succulents as he wanted create, to create a beautiful pieces, pottery for succulents, and eventually um, became a lifelong career. So thank you for joining us today, uh, Kuya Joey and Therese. Let's get the film clip going. Welcome to segment number three with conversations on We have two very special local ceramic artists. First, Sir John Betty John is based in Laguna, Pansol, near Pansol. And the beauty of this is he's part of the five people that created the movement in the 1970s. That was part of the ceramic stoneware high fire movement. Castro, a student of the Adrian Petitjan 
school in Greenbelt will be joining us and talk about how he was able to build a career in the city. I'm just lucky that when I was 22 years old, I walked into a pottery studio and it hit me, you know, the lightning bolt and I just made the decision, I swear almost instantly, that I wanted to do that and I, I made a decision to do whatever it took to do that. I was lucky I met my wife some years later here in the Philippines. Um, I should mention I'm half, my mother's Filipina, although I grew up in the U.S. I came here in the mid-70s. Actually, I was on my way to Japan, because Japan is like a mecca for potters. And uh, while I was here, I started looking around. I found some, you know, looking around to find materials, resources. And I realized there was uh, not too much of a ceramic scene. So I started looking around, find, looking for clay. And I realized that this was the ideal situation. If you want to learn how to be a potter, then the experience of having to go out and dig your own clay and make your own kiln, it's probably the best learning experience you can have. Well, there were only a handful of us, and we weren't very close together, and we hardly ever saw each other. There were, hardly, there were very few exhibits also at that time, so we all, we all struggled to sell our works. There was only a few galleries at that time that were, that were interested. I actually, there was a time I actually put pots in a suitcase and walked around to shops to sell them. It's, Tess and I are a team. It's a, it's kind of a, it's, it's a good thing when a husband and wife work together in pottery. Because pottery can be hard. And uh, so we understand each other very well. And we, you know, we've always supported each other. We each do our own. We each, we each do our own share of the work. So we started a small workshop in Manila, and later we moved to Calamba Laguna. In, this was in 1980. And as I was saying, we were, there were very few of us, and we, we really worked in isolation. So we worked for, we might go for a year or more, or two years without talking to any other potters, which is not an ideal situation. It leads to a sort of, a, it leads to a sort of stagnation when you work like that by yourself for so long. So at that point, we realized that if we didn't start teaching, that nothing would happen. So we were reluctant to teach, and we're not naturally teachers, but we started teaching. It also, to, it also was a way to, to make a living. But more importantly, it was a way to establish a community. We didn't see this at first. But right away when we started teaching, immediately there became a group of people, a core group of people that were all very interested. This group became larger and larger until the point where sometime in the 90s maybe we, we opened our own pottery school. Well, the great, th the great thing about ceramics is that it, it, can, be, it, it can be so many things. So. Immediately, you know, there are people attracted to sculpture, they're you know, functional, even uh, people are attracted to uh, conceptual work, even. But the, Tessie and I always concentrated on uh, high fire, sort of traditional Asian style stoneware. Ceramics and pottery have a, have, have a long tradition in the, in the whole world, in that scene, especially in Asia, and in, even here in the Philippines. It's one of the earliest art forms. A lot of, you know, the potters, are, it's like a, we hand down from one to another skills and, and, uh, and the passion for what we do. So I think of, of, all of, the, of all of the arts, I think we have the strongest link to the past. So it, it, it's, a, it's a good thing in the sense that uh, we learn from those who went before us because ceramics is a, diff is a difficult medium in those I think potters we generally accept that it's, it's almost, in a way it's almost impossible to be original. But that's not the point I mean to say. There, there's a vocabulary of shapes and forms and ideas. And every generation of potter takes, you know, continues it, 
adds a little bit, or you know, learns something else about it. So it, it, it's something linked to the past, but it's always changing. So that's that's what keeps it vital. I mean, it's amazing that you know the potters before us have done you know almost any. It's a cliche, almost shape, any shape that you do, probably somebody did it before. But at the same time, that you know, it's a challenge also to to take it to take that a little bit further. Always, there's a lot of skill involved. So it's a long process of learning skills. We actually, you know, I think most players would agree it takes a few years. Some some people would say four or five years to be a competent thrower on the wheel, for example. But even after after uh, after learning those skills, though, you have to kind of forget it and go past that. One famous potter, Hamada, said, "It shouldn't feel too difficult. It's, it should feel. It doesn't. It shouldn't be like climbing a mountain. It should be like walking down the mountain in a cool breeze." The more a potter gets involved with his processes and raw materials, I mean, the better it's going to be. I always compare it to being a chef. You know, a good chef, you know, will start by looking for the fresh produce, and then he'll look at the produce, and then he then he will decide what to do with it and how best to use it. That, that, that approach works very well. You know, the best thing is travel. The best, the best remedy, the best way to learn really might be travel. You really should go around and watch people work. And it's not so much to learn the techniques, no. It's, it's not really just about technique. It's about learning, it's about seeing why, why do people do the things they wait you know, how, Why do they do it the way they do it, no. Or how, you might say, try to figure out how people think when they're working. Because there's so many ways that there's so as I was saying, there's so many ways to handle clay. You can be very delicate with it, and you can be very rough with it. it. It has all of those possibilities. So it's always interesting to see how other people work and what they're how they how they choose to handle their clay. Uh, later on we went to we got invited to Japan. Tessie and I were lucky we got invited to do a residency in Shigaraki, Japan, uh, back in, uh, this was uh, two, 2017, if I'm not mistaken. So Shigaraki is a, is a village up in, uh, not too far from Kyoto, but it's a, it's a village famous for wood fire, for anagama fire, which is the kind of fire that Pablo and I uh, like to do. Uh, it, it, it had been a dream of mine to visit Shigaraki for my whole life, actually. So we're lucky we got to stay there for two months in a place called the Shigaraki uh, Ceramic Cultural Center, which is like a it's like a huge park uh, on a hill, and uh, they have multiple kilns and multiple studios. And at uh, any time of the year, there's five or six uh, artists work from other parts of the world working alongside probably five or six Japanese potters. This has been this has been ongoing for 20, 30 years. And uh, it's like at one time or another, like all the all the most famous potters in the world have worked there. There's a there's a wall with names on it. It's just awesome to look at. So we were just lucky we were invited. It's mind-boggling. Like I mean, to walk in you know the pottery store in, in Shigaraki, you can choose from you know 50 kinds of clay, you know, different colors and different textures, and, and the tools and the equipment. And then uh, to be told, you know, you can just get whatever you want. <laughs> you know, take the bike to the market every afternoon. And we, were, we, were, we had a small apartment so we could cook for ourselves. It was, it was great. I like, hope I can go back. But to young, I would say to young potters, you know, that now that the, if, the, if the virus, if the COVID situation, if we get back to normal and travel becomes normal, I think the festivals and residencies will open up again. And it's just one of the best things you can do for, you know, for a young artist. I always look to see the ones who will give back. You know, it's, it's easy to take from the field, you know, but 
you know, you want to see people give who can give back also, because that's what that's what's going to make it uh, thrive. Yeah. I first enrolled in the Petty Jan Mendoza School in 2003 to make pots for my plants. I knew what I wanted to make, so uh, that's where it began. And then the art itself took over, became a passion. Then eventually it became a profession. So it became bowls, platters, jars, vases. The whole works. So eventually, I drifted away from my succulent collection and making pots. I went all over the country looking for different potters, observing their studios, firing in their kilns, and uh, using their clay, finding sources of their clay, like Ugu Bigyan, Sagada Pottery, Pablo Capati's farm, Adi Mendoza, John Petijan, the whole Jaime Guzman and El Bacueva. All the potters, I searched them all the way to Baguio, Quezon, all over these places. I went on a journey looking for different potters. Then subconsciously, not knowing that I would become one. So after four years of doing that, filing in the school of the Petty Jans, when I see the seniors' works who had their own kilns, it was different. It was not like what I was getting in the electric kilns of the Petty Jam School. So when I see different exhibitions and their works are much different, much more depth, much more beautiful, much more character, I found out that the secret was that they had their own kilns, their own gas kilns. They made their own glazes. So that in itself was a large stepping stone for, for me to get my own kiln. That's what made me decide to build my own here. I live in, in Mandaluyong right by Hensa. So, in a condo, nine-story building. How do you build a studio in a condominium? So that was the hardest part. So the first thing is getting a kill. With the kiln, everything emanates from that central point. So the decision to buy a kiln and establish it in the rooftop of the building, which I get to use until now, led me to open my own studio for to teaching. After four years of learning the craft and being a ceramist, being a potter. The key word is sharing. So you wanted to share that the emotion, the feeling you get when you're throwing a pot. So I wanted to share that. So I opened my school in 2011. It was all word of mouth. It had nothing to do with social media. It had nothing to do with all the hype. In that I screened my students to be sure that they wanted to pursue it in that they wanted to take it a step further. So I wanted only serious students. And all students wanted to get on the wheel had to do hand building. No choice, no ifs, nor buts. Hand building is the core center of everything you will do on the wheel eventually. Why is it different these days? Yeah, people just want to get on the wheel and take Instagram and take pictures and post it. And they're gone. You'll never see them anymore. I think the pandemic actually was a good thing for me in that I got burnt out teaching. I got frustrated in that there's just so many people who just want to have the experience and then bucket list it and check and then I just concentrate on my work and not have to handle other people's work. Because behind the scenes, you're handling their work, you're loading the kiln, you're using your glazes. So they don't get to see what's behind the scenes. Really. Pottery is a career, or ceramics, or ceramic art. It's an interesting thing. I mean, it, it's, it's a good life. It's difficult. All things are difficult in the beginning, but they get easier as you go on. 
but the, re the rewards are very great. I mean, first of all, the reward of just taking the, something from the earth and turning it into something with your hands. I mean, that's just a, I mean, where do you get an experience like that? And, you know, and then, and then to earn a living from it. I mean, what, what a great feeling that is. I'd like to say more power to the ceramic art world. And I'd like, you know, I would encourage anybody who's interested to, to get their hands dirty, to work with clay. There are so many opportunities now. You just have to seek them out. And, uh, you know, I think art fair, like this event, like Art Fair Philippines, to include ceramic art, is, is just bringing the whole scene to a new level. So, so thank you. We'd like to remind everybody to please type in your questions at the Q&A button so that um, John and Tessie is here also with us. Hello, Tessie. And Joey and Pablo can all answer, can answer your questions. John-san, you have to unmute your um, Zoom, please. Okay. Okay. Hey, good morning. Hi, guys. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. It's great to be here. Thank you. Well, nice to see all of you. Okay, first question, let's get right to it. What makes a pot a good pot? Do you have a favorite pot? Can you tell us more about it and what makes it special to you and what is the story? <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> well, that's something we're, we're trying to figure out our whole life. But the easy answer is, uh, is you just have to go with your heart. And, it's sometimes then to try to see clearly when you look at when you look at a pot and you use a pot or you feel a pot try to see it clearly you know don't cloud your judgment just try to feel it i think that's the that's the best way and and there are just so many there are pots i would say that have changed my life <laughs> looking just looking at them and seeing them in uh, in collections and museums traveling around looking at pots yeah Joey. Uh, me, because uh, I look at the technique of how it's made. So when I see a pot, I'm trying to imagine how the hand marks, the trimming, the throwing, you can see the character of the potter from the works he leaves. So sometimes uh, a pot should tell a good story and feel good. Oh, I, I guess that's it. Pablo, you. There's such a thing called um, the soul of a pot. So what does that mean? That means like if you put your soul when you're making your pot, that's a good pot. Uh, I guess I'll give an example. This one, I made it in Japan when I was 13, 14. And this was when I was still learning. And up to now, I can't make this same pot anymore. I will, I will never be able to make the same bowl but it means so much to me. Uh, that's why my advice to the beginners out there, when you say your pot is ugly, keep them. Because once you learn, you'll never be able to make them. And they're probably the most beautiful pots you ever made in your life. Okay, next question. What, challenge, what challenges do you face most as artists? Maybe John and Tessie both would like to hear from you. I mean, from Tessie too. Yeah, I think it's mostly clay, you know. The thing is we're, we're, we're trying to find clay to, you know, to, materials. to use materials and uh, yeah, I think that's the most, that's the hardest thing to do is just to search for materials to make our own clay. Is it the same for you, John? Yeah, we've. that's always been a, well, we enjoy that too, looking for materials. 
especially here in the Philippines where, you know, the, if the goal is to make a Philippine pot, I think the, the search would probably start with searching for Philippine materials. Have you found where? Um, oh, yes. Um, yeah. there, there, oh, we, we have a wealth of uh, clay and rocks that can be used for ceramics. Yeah. So, I mean, from, nor from, uh, from north to south. It's just you have to go there and find them. Yeah, we've been using we've been using a lot of you know natural materials from the Philippines. We mix our own clay, and but it's getting harder and harder to get them because uh, there's not the, the industry that supports raw materials is not really very strong. Yeah. Joey, for you, uh, yeah, I guess just challenges. Yeah, because uh, before there was only one supplier of uh, stoneware clay, and it was just a plain white, ordinary looking, unusable on its own. So we had to add, put additives and manipulate the clay and make it usable for our purposes because it was like a tile white clay. So after a while, I got so bored at using that white clay that uh, started importing clays from Japan and uh, soon maybe from Thailand and um, blending it with local clays to make it usable. Pablo, you. Uh, with me, it's more of during the making process because as you all know, there's four basic techniques. There's hand building, pinching, coiling slabs, and there's wheel throwing. And obviously when I make my sculptures, I use hand building. And then when I make my traditional wear, I use the wheel. And when I have to put the two together, I really have, a, I have to mature more. I have a very difficult time putting it together. I just really have to think two different ways. It's two different things for me. And hopefully in the future, I can really combine it. For some reason, they just don't gel properly these days or haven't been, I'm trying to work on it. It's difficult. What is your daily routine? Let's start with Joey. Yeah, because uh, me, I'm a workaholic. So I work every day, all day, including Sundays like today. Uh, it's uh, more of a lifestyle. So I wake up five, six, get to the studio by seven and work until I burn out till about lunchtime. Then uh, the work involves not only just creating pots, it's uh, loading the kiln, testing your glazes. So the preparing clay, so the workload in a day takes several processes. So you're preparing clay for next week. You're testing your glazes for next month. Then you're making clay for, for use in the afternoon. So it's, it's multi-layered things. It's more like a lifestyle. So my life revolves around that whole process. Would you say it's like nine to five also for you, Joey? Like yeah, more five or less nine to five. Yes. Off? I mean, is that some? Is that is it something like that? Yes, and uh, the good thing is that I work from home, so I can take naps. I can leave it for a, an hour or two to dry while I'm working on something else. I can go in and out of the studio whenever I want. Sometimes I work late at night sometimes early morning. So it's really a lifestyle. Is that the same for you, John and Tessie? Yeah, what, what Joey said is absolutely right. But it's also, it's kind of like, a potter is like a farmer. I think we're, we're very close to the earth, but the routines are very much like a farmer. Like Joey was saying, you're always anticipating, you know, you're preparing something and you're anticipating and you probably, we, we won't see the results for, uh, for weeks or a month or so. So it's really about anticipation. But there are definitely, you know, it helps to have a routine because you have to be very close to the work. You have to watch the way the clay is drying. You have to, you know, and anticipate you having clay ready for tomorrow and, and all the various steps. So yes, it's like Joey said. Pablo. I'm a little bit of the opposite because I value my sleep and I love to sleep a lot. <laughs> and um, so my schedule is very erratic. Uh, if there's no deadline, uh, I have to force myself to make every day because it's important to make every day. But if there's a deadline, there's that 
there's that thing in the back of your head and I can go on and on and on and on and on and not sleep actually. And just so that, and then the, when the creative juice pumps in, it's just nonstop and then you exhaust yourself and then you go back to sleep. <laughs> How do you decide whether to keep a pot for yourself or to sell it? And to follow up, does the pot that you keep for yourself, is that more valuable than what you choose to sell? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> well, uh, whenever we open the kiln, there's always there's always one or two pieces that you know that attracts you the most, that you like the best. So it's like it's sometimes really so hard to give it up, you know, or sell it or something. But we do keep a whole bunch of team things that probably our children our children will inherit <laughs> but it's really really hard to you know to let go of your works it's it's important also not to not be detached to not be attached to your work because you cannot you cannot you you cannot handle clay properly if you feel it's something so precious to you i mean in order to, in order to work freely with clay you have to have this sense of detachment, like not, it's not any big deal to lose your work or something like that. I guess it's true because you know, like uh, you can't keep all your pots. <laughs> you have, we don't have space anymore for pots. <laughs> yeah. Lucky for us, you've, uh, you've let go of a few really beautiful ones. So <laughs> Pablo, what about, what about for you? Uh, for me, actually, before it was very difficult, like John said and Tessie said, it's very difficult to detach yourself from your pots because, you know, the process is quite, uh, it's a long process and you get attached to it. But, and, but somebody told me, you know, you need to, you have to understand the, the reason why people are buying your pots is because they love your work and they're going to value it. So then I <clears throat> realized that, okay, it's okay to sell them, but with my Anagama works, I still have this very, very difficult, Anagama, the wood firing kiln, still have this very, very, very uh, intense connection and romance with my work now. It's so hard to let go, but that's why it's only when I have exhibitions when I put them out and still I keep uh, a couple of them for myself. Joey, what about you? Yeah, the hardest thing really in the start was to detach yourself from the works you create. Uh, in the start, it's very difficult talaga. Uh, so when I was just beginning, it was really just giving them away to relatives, to friends, so that you get to see them eventually when you, uh, over time. Pero every few kiln loads, there will be a few that I tend to keep. And uh, through the years, it's been almost 20 years, they tend to be like family pictures. You can see the progress of your quality of your works. So they're like snapshots over time. So those are the pieces that I tend to keep that I, uh, they're quirky, they're, they're not the usual stuff. One out of 10 in the kiln load that will really stand out. And that's what I get attached to. They may not be perfect or uh, beautiful, but the, the story is really there of your progress. Okay, next question. Do you do any of you have any apprenticeship programs? I think this was already asked yesterday, but I guess um, people really are curious about this. You'll probably have a long uh, waiting list if you say yes. I guess the answer is no, but. Sila <laughs> Jan, they had a few apprentices uh, a few years ago. But we, is it a formal me, program? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, John. We've had a few apprentices over the years. Yeah. But uh, we don't turn, you know, if people come around and they're very interested, we, we never turn them away. So there, there's different levels of apprenticeship. Yeah, we've had... We always encourage people as much as we can. Yeah. We ha we've had two very, very long apprenticeships, like 
Hadrian yeah. Mendoza and uh, Anton Kuinyang, which live in the print. So yeah, we live, live in with us for a year. <laughs> and uh, and some that comes and goes, you know, a few months, a few weeks. I mean, um, I was will, I was willing to get an apprentice, but uh, the Delta happened, so uh, I didn't want people entering my studio. So maybe when it normalizes, I'm willing to take apprentices. It's because I'm a private person, so it's hard for me really to open my space up to somebody I'm not that close to or not familiar with. So when I work, it's loud music, it's rock and roll, it's you know intense. There's shouting involved. There's you know it's a physical. It's like a sport going to the gym, something like that. So I try to tend to keep my studio life private, but uh, I'm willing to take apprentices when the pandemic loosens up. Okay, Pablo. Um, to be honest, I don't think I'm mature enough to have an apprentice. Uh, I need to learn more and uh, it's very complicated to have an apprentice. It's a very big responsibility because, you know, you, it's, you could either change somebody's life or you could ruin it. I don't know. So maybe in the future, maybe, but not at the moment. Sorry. Okay. Who, if any, are the artists you look to for inspiration at this stage in your careers? Lucy Ree, Lucy Ree up to now. Tell us more about uh, him, her. Lucy Ree is, uh, she's a British potter. Uh, very traditional work, but uh, it's just her, it's traditional work, but it's, the shapes are very avant-garde and very sleek and stylish. And it's just so classic. And her shapes and colors, just really blend really well and it's so beautiful like you really it shows that delicate touch that, that like a powder of delicate powder's touch uh also i think right now she's one of the most prominent potters in the whole world with regards to her work in value but she's passed away she's, she's left us and she was working when um, pablo like Ooh, sorry, Johnson, please help me out on this one. No, no, no I'm just asking because I'm curious. Um, is it so not a contemporary? No, no more. No, 70s, 70s, maybe 60s, 70s. I see. So, but after, until they yes. go ahead, please, Johnson. After World War, Lucy Ree went, uh, was a refugee, went to England after World War II. And she worked up through the what, when did she pass away? 80s, yes. Uh huh. Uh, she was in England during the war, actually, and and uh, when she was uh, during the war, she was making buttons and you know small things yeah, to well, sell. Because we, we admire her a lot. She's yeah. a great potter. Also, she's, Hans Koper is another one. Yeah, he's contemporary of Lucery, although a little bit younger. Bernard Leach. One of the potters who started who started uh, the the Ming Gay movement. Yeah, we're we're movement. potters in the, there was a movement after early early twentieth century, a movement that rediscovered uh, folk pottery and promoted it. A group, there was an Englishman called Bernard Leach, and then there were a bunch of, a bunch of Japanese potters like Shoji Hamada. Shoji, Shoji Hamada. Shoji Hamada. Yes. What about Great. you, Joey? Me, uh, I was fortunate enough to spend around four or six years learning under the Petty Jan. So I looked up to my <laughs> teachers, Pete Cortez, Adi Mendoza, the Petty Jans, Jaime de Guzman, Ugo Bigyan, all the senior potters who uh, helped me when I was starting out in pottery. So I'm fortunate enough to have even met them and become friends with them. So they are my idols. Yes. And peers like Pablo and Adi Mendoza, friends, peers, teachers, mentors. Yeah. Yeah, you guys have a very close knit community, it seems, from what I've observed. Right? Uh, no choice, yeah. <laughs> and fathers are good people. <laughs> okay, what? Is your advice for beginner potters? We got this a lot, this whole the three sessions, but you know, it's 
it's nice to hear from all of the speakers what they say. So I don't know, Jolene. Me, uh, as a teacher, I've been teaching for almost like more than 15 years. So it's always starting at the basics. You, and uh, don't just stick to one school or one teacher. Because one teacher will teach you one thing. Another teacher will teach another thing. But uh, you have your own uh, technique that you might develop on your own. So the best really is to learn from different teachers, masters. The better the teacher, the better you become. There's a lot of teachers that are just that just started during the pandemic. So you can only be good as your teacher. And if they're not that good, how good can you get? So my advice is take lessons, classes, workshops from different teachers. Yeah, that's it. John and Tessie. Yeah, it's really good to expose yourself to different to different styles and you know artists. It's just like there's so there's so many world all over the world conventions, set, you know, seminars on pottery, and it's really a good thing because you make friends with all the potters from different parts of the world, and they're really really very friendly and very and we're really all very close, <laughs> all the potters from any part of the world. It's, it's it's like it's so different actually you can be you're it's like you go to a pottery thing from another country and you're so welcome and then you become like part of a family and then you just you know everybody shows you how they work and what their their styles and all you know all these things it's really really nice uh Mm, uh, my advice is to watch other people work. I heard somebody say you have to be like a voyeur. Just really, really watch people work and try to figure out what they're doing. And then, you know, just be patient, keep at it. The rewards come. Yeah, patience. <laughs> it's just, you have to really focus on the basics, be very patient, and you have to be more stubborn than the clay. <laughs> Sounds really good. Okay, from Mark Valenzuela. Hi, Mark. You should be up here with them, I think, okay? Um, <laughs> as artists who have been working and making for a long time, how do you adapt and respond to changing contexts and times? Yeah. Who wants to start? Uh, maybe I should start because I'm the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting thing. When you get to when you get to be my age, you see, you know, I'm I think I'm watching like a third or maybe even a fourth generation emerge. And it's really a challenge because you know every generation sees things in a slight in a different way. And it, it makes you have to reevaluate your own ways of thinking. But that's a great thing, you know, that's a gift because you know that's if you if you keep an open mind, that will keep you from stagnating. <laughs> Although it can be very daunting, you know, to see the young, you know, young people will come up and challenge you. <laughs> but that's a great thing. Keep you humble. Joey. Oh, Tessie, sorry. Tessie, you, not, yeah. okay. It's okay. John said what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, because of the pandemic, that's where the there's like a shift that happened. Uh, people got locked in at home and then pottery workshops just sprouted out of nowhere. So just the last two years, there was like maybe five, six, seven, eight studios popped up in the Metro Manila during the pandemic. So even the galleries had to adapt in making online activities. So we had to make works or we had to take pictures of works to post online and when you take a picture, does it translate well? So we make forms that really translate well when you're taking a picture and posting it online. So maybe that's the challenge lately in that the online thing happened during these last two years. Pablo, you took that up quickly, right? I mean, jumping on or like pivoting to online. Like really quick. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, you have to be, you know, you have to be flexible. You have to adapt to the times. Just like John Stan said that you have to be open-minded and know what, what's going on because otherwise you, know, you can't be complacent and stagnant. Eh? You have to really, really 
consider uh, well even be more beautiful now is it's like we're our customers is the whole world because of online. It just generates this bigger picture. So you really have to be very open-minded. And going back to what Mark asked, to be able to change with times, you really, really have to be disciplined and you have to keep practicing every day. It doesn't necessarily mean you know how to do it already, that you can do it again. That's the thing with pottery. You really need to practice, especially the wheel. It's like, like I said the other day, it's like a marathon. You got to keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. If you stop, sometimes it feels really weird. You think you can make some, you've made certain shapes before, but you can't make it anymore again. And then with those shapes, what, how can you adapt it to, like John said, the, the younger kids, because I'm old now, they, they really challenge you. They want to, they want to like push the limits and they, they're more reckless. So I was quite reckless before. I asked so many stupid questions, made so many mistakes. And then thinking now, I'm like, oh my gosh, what was I thinking? But then now when I talk to the younger people, in some of them, I can see myself and, I, and it, it puts a smile on my face. That means I've learned a bit somehow. Okay, a comment from Mike Tomacruz. Thank you, Mike, for joining us for three out of three days. Actually, Thanks, you answered his question, but he just wants to say, hi, John, Tessie, and Joey, big fan of your works. He was asking about your typical day, which you answered earlier, but I just wanted to um, express his sentiment that he's a big fan of your works. So next question from Dara, who's been asking really good questions. Do you ever get bored with what you do? How do you get yourself out of that headspace? Um. Yes, I was doing a lot of uh, I was doing a lot of uh, functional works before, and I just kind of got bored with it. So I started making you know sculpture like things, and which I got bored again. So now I'm I'm combining I'm combining uh, functional and sculptural <laughs> together. So <laughs> it gets boring sometimes. <laughs> Me, I, I never get bored. I'm like a little kid. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'll say also, repetition is repetition is the soul of functional pottery. I, and I never get bored repeat, you know, repeating forms. Uh, me, by default, the the form I really love to make is a bowl, a simple bowl. But uh, there's so much depth in a bowl in that when you feel it, touch it, see it, there's so many variations of a bowl. And I, like challenging myself to keep making things because I want to make 100 things at the same time, but you can only do one at a time. So if I get more than one, there's 99 other things that I like to make or challenges me to wake up every morning to make that different thing. So uh, I never stick to one thing in that I will make jars, vases, flower vases, different, different things. There's just so many things to do that it's impossible to get bored. Pablo. I'm, I'm like Tessie, I get bored all the time. So prior to the pandemic, what would really keep me going is I promised myself I'd travel four times in a year and try to visit a different country. It's like work and travel, like with regards to pottery. So then at least I can gauge my skill level, see where I'm at in the whole world. Uh, see what I need to learn. Also, at the same time, parang it's uh, to know that, oh, I'm okay at uh, this level and I can be competitive or not competitive, but at least I know as much as other people in the world. And then during the pandemic, I couldn't get bored because I was fortunate enough to be able to put up that Pub Robots IG and it, was, it just went crazy. So I've been doing a lot of functional work and I've been working every day, happy to say. Okay, before we ask the next question, I just want to tell you guys, we have 70 people tuning in to you guys. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. What, any tips to improve hand building skills for beginners? I think uh, the clay, you have to really know your clay, the how soft or how hard it is. The problem, another problem with uh, beginner classes, they don't teach you how to wedge your clay. 
And wedging is such an integral part of knowing the consistency of the clay. And because you don't know how to wedge, sometimes the students, I notice it's either they use it, uh, clay that's too soft, which makes it collapse quite quickly, or it's way too hard, which makes it crack and hard to attach. By learning how to wedge, you get this, you learn your own taste of consistency and when what you want to play, the malleability, the plasticity. And I think this is being neglected at certain uh, workshops. Any other tips? Uh, don't try to rush yourself into getting into the wheel immediately. Uh, pay your dues. I mean, learn the basics. What's so hard about that? Uh, if it doesn't excite you, then the wheel won't excite you. So even though you're just pinching a simple form, uh, there should be a connection already. If there's no connection, then don't even bother. You're nodding your head, John. Yeah, agree. No, well, both of them. Yeah. That's timing. Timing is so important, and uh, under, understanding the clay, working with the working with the with the clay at the right consistency. Yes. Do you have a favorite stage in the process? I like making and trimming the clay. Well, I do. Well, yeah. But I don't really like to glaze. <laughs> really? <laughs> Your pieces are always so beautifully glazed. Yes, it's so hard for me to do that. <laughs> but I enjoy making things and, and, and you know, trimming and finishing. But then when it comes to glazing, I just like, uh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> that sounds really surprising to me, okay. <laughs> Some people say there's two kinds of potters, the fire potters and the mud potters. Some people like uh, the excitements of firing and other people like, you know, work getting their hands in the clay. I'm probably the, the, mud, the mud potter type. <laughs> it looks best to me when it's fresh off the wheel. It looks, it looks really good to me. <laughs> Joey or Pablo? Me, I'm in love with the whole process. I'm in love with pottery. I'm in love with ceramics. It's my life. It's my lifestyle. So every aspect from the clay preparation to the glazing, to the firing, to the unloading, it's, it's all consuming for me. It's my passion. So I love the whole process, end to end. You, Pablo. I agree. I agree. I agree with Kuya Joey like uh, you have to love the whole thing it's your life you've chose this life but um, specifically when I am getting ready for my anagama kiln my wood firing kiln I love I really I think this for me is what there's my passion really just like I can't help myself when I fire the wood kiln because yeah it's totally different from gas kilns and electric kilns and it's just that natural aspect to it using wood clay in your kiln, water, and then the works that come out from it's just too magical. It's just mind blowing. Okay, from Mike again. Joey, love your works on the wall. Is that a new series? Uh, on the wall here, that's a uh, Avellana Gallery, the umbrellas <laughs> of an artist. I forgot the name. But you do have works in Avellana. I can see it in front of you. Yes, right. uh, the, I hardly make dinner sets. A lot of people have been requesting me through the years to make them uh, dinner sets and Albert was able to convince me to make a set for eight. Uh, so, and then I asked what's good with Albert is that I asked him what, what do you want me to show with him? He said, it's up to you. How many for eight? What kind? He says, as, as long as you make it personal, make it as best as you can. So the last set of plates I think I made was for you, Tricky, ah, uh, you three much. or four years ago. <laughs> so that was the last time I made plates as a set. So, yeah, so just a little plug. I mean, your works uh, for the Art Fair can be seen in the Art Fair Philippines website at the Avellana Art Gallery page, or they can visit Avellana Art Studio. Gallery. And J then Studio for also. yeah, Pablo and, and John and Tessie, their works are at J Studio. Correct. I, Joey I also, saw them. Joey also has works in J Studio headquarters in this. Yeah. Okay. What's, what's good because of this art fair, we were able to group around 
10 new artists who participated in Art Fair Philippines. Uh, picked by Pablo, these are the, the new graduate, the new potters in the past two years in the pandemic. So J Studio was able to uh, set up a exhibition for us, including the masters, including the newbies and first time more exhibitions. Yes. Actually, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Tessie. Sorry. I said I don't have anything there now. Aha. <laughs> There's still time. Okay. <laughs> uh, it actually, tricky. The idea of that uh, exhibit was to put samples of works of people that have studios and workshops. So then, if there are people that want to learn, it's best to go on the AFP online page to see the works of the artists there because most of those artists either teach or do online classes or have studios that allow them that you could visit. So it's a good reference. Yeah, well, on our part, we're so happy to have like a good selection of um, pottery for this year's art fair. Okay, next question from Dara again. I oh, know we asked this already. Okay, how do you balance your time? Making work, um, the creative process versus Necessary necessary tasks of selling and making a living. Example, photographing, marketing. I guess these days posting on social media. How do you balance your time between? I'm your life. Pablo, you Can I answer. Her? Oh, yeah, okay, Pablo. go ahead, Joey. No, Joey. Uh, uh, just uh, like me and Jan, we have uh, our spouses. So Jan has Tessie, I have Lali, and they're really behind the scenes in that uh, when it comes to meeting for Zoom, submitting proposals, collecting, coordinating with other artists, it's, uh, it's a teamwork and that uh, I tend to concentrate on the, on the creative. creative process, making work. <laughs> That's what I do once I fire it and it's done. Usually my wife takes over and that they coordinate the galleries and uh, submit online uploading stuff for like the deadline for Art Fair Philippines. Ah, Art in the Park was extended, so good thing. <laughs> uh, so the whole March was like a storm in that I think the art scene is starting to get back to normal. So without our back, uh, back help from our spouses, it would have been difficult for all of us. I don't do those things. <laughs> I was gonna say Tessie's an artist too. So how's I mean, how does she balance her times? I just like I work a little, you know. I I I do all kinds of things for the house, you know, for cooking and all those. No, not only that. Tessie was learning to weld recent, trying to learn to weld recently. <laughs> wow. You know, we have to be a jack of all trades, you know, to be a potter. Me too. I've learned I've learned a lot of mechanical skills that I never thought I would. <laughs> But the other things, like you were saying, photography or business management, yeah, those are things. Those things are so important. And <laughs> yeah, John does that. <laughs> uh, you have to. I hope they teach those things in school. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we've had to learn all those things too. You, um, Pablo. For me, I'm, yeah, I'm lucky because uh, <laughs> I, I have my three. I have my three kids. Hi, Nami and Kijan Bing. Love you. <laughs> they help me with everything, with the photos. With the uh, shipping out of works, with uh, I'm gonna do an online shop soon. So they do all the technical stuff, and I I get to focus on the production side of things. So it helps me. They help me a lot. So it works out quite fine. Okay, from Anna, um, I guess it's in Adelaide. Why do you think there's such a strong sense of community among ceramic artists? Is it because the process is inherently more collaborative than other art forms? Yes, I think so. And like I said, we have the mentality of farmers. We're, we don't have the mentality of uh, fine artists. <laughs> I guess because it's a it's a bit of a struggle, so we have to we have to collaborate. So we have to you need we need to support each other. I think that's what it is. And uh, I mean, I know you guys always go ahead, Joey. Sorry. Uh, it's a honestly, it's a difficult uh, ceramics is a difficult process. So. Sometimes you lack ingredients. We ask a tin oxide from a friend or 
rutil that are difficult to get. So that's where the camaraderie comes in, in that we help each other. Because it's a difficult art form. It's uh, applied science. It involves importing materials and uh, supporting each other is uh, the next best thing. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to disagree with John and, and Joey, but we're lucky here in the Philippines that we have a community because, like I said, in the 70s, there were only about six or seven of Sila John and Tessie, Nelfa, um, Mang Jaime de Guzman. Sorry, I forgot the others. But then, uh, so they created this community and they had to help each other. And you have to remember, this is when there were no cell phones and hardly any landlines. So the resources and even books, to that mat for that matter, there were probably... There were like three or four Bibles that the potter would need to be able to explore. So they had this community and me and Kuya Joey coming into the photo, they showed us how you had to grow with each other and had to share. Because <clears throat> otherwise, like John said, if you work and isolate yourself, you're, you're just, just going to stagnate. and Your growth will be like really flat. But when you come to this community, it just goes really, the curve goes steeper. With all my travels, it's so competitive. People, people don't share. People fight each other. People, uh, they, 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 because it's a grant-based system, so it's super competitive. They won't tell you what their new project is because they just applied for a grant. They don't want to even. They don't want. They won't welcome you to their studios. I'm not gonna name the countries that I've been to because this is very. I know uh, a lot of places I've been to. Because, uh, the government, they, they're lucky they're supported by their government, but they have to go through that grant system. And without the grant system, they're going to have to do odd jobs to be able to be a potter. They can't be a full-time potters. Either they teach and they do their pottery. And it's very rare that once you reach that level that you're a full-time potter, that means you've made it in other countries. I was just going to say earlier that actually when you guys have your ceramic events, it's always so much fun because... You guys are all together there. And um, I'm even us for Art in the Park, we always considered you as one group, right? It's yes, only now yeah. that uh, there's so many of you that we can't do that anymore. But yeah, that sense of community and camaraderie is very apparent here. So that's, I mean, that's what makes it quite special. I'm dealing with you guys. Okay, next question. Sir John, you mentioned the process of learning and then unlearning. Can you tell us more about the process of unlearning and how so that has changed the work? What has everyone's experience of unlearning been like? Yeah, that's the thing about skills. So when the skills are hard to acquire, there is a danger that you become obsessed with the skill. Like, you know, like you're so good at something and then that's it, you know. You know, that you have this sense that you're so good at what you do then, and that's what's important. That's the expression. But that is not the expression. Skill is only a tool. So it's, it's a danger as like, there are lots of things in technical arts. There's a lot of danger, like glazes, for example, you, you start to, when you start to research glazes, you can get very obsessed with it, like in, into the chemistry of it. And then what will happen is you'll make very beautiful glazes, but your pots will maybe won't be so great. <laughs> so it's a, it's a skill, skill is a very seductive thing. So it can be very difficult to unlearn. It's, it's, I've I struggled with that for some years. Maybe I still do. So, you know, when you when you get good at anything, even like throwing or firing kilns or whatever, then you have to sort of let go of that skill and then allow some uh, some intuition back in, <laughs> if if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, uh, because so ceramics agree. is such, so, yes, agree. It's ceramics is such a technical mm -hmm. aspect, especially like glazing. Yes. Uh, you tend to take everything seriously in that the decimal points have to count. But after a while, you step back and learn and rely on your intuition. And uh, yeah, true enough, uh, your intuition tends to be more reliable than decimals and multiplication and, and the mathematics of glazing and stuff. Maybe it's, it's like, it goes back to the basics. You know, you really, 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 really have to, I hate saying master the word master the basics, but you really have to make it to top. 
you when you do your wheel, that, especially on the wheel, once a potter's goal will be to make symmetrical shape. You really need to focus on how to make symmetrical shape. And like John said, Johnson says, you you get so obsessed with it that it's so almost like perfect, but there's no such thing as perfect. And then now what do you do? Now, now you want to distort it. You want to unlearn that. And I guess this is when you learn your style, but then it's not always successful. It's very difficult because your skill level is so high already, it's an automatic that everything will be symmetrical and it gets boring. And uh, then you have to break it down. So I guess it's like drawing. You have to learn how to draw first, then you do abstract. It's the same thing. Okay, related to that, as seasoned artists, when you've been working with specific techniques and styles, do you find yourself wanting to try or explore other techniques or shift to a different style? Sorry, can you say that again, Tricky? I didn't quite okay. get the question. As seasoned artists, yeah. When you've been working with specific techniques and styles, do you find yourselves wanting to try or explore other techniques or even shift to different styles? Yeah, of course, there are so many things. I, I have a whole list of things I would still like to learn. The great, the great thing about ceramics is there are just so many there are so many styles and ways of working, so many types of clay, so many ways of firing. You, no one would ever master it in a lifetime. So that's, it's a huge challenge. So, you know, we're, I'm 50 years and I'm still learning some new things. Yeah, the constant search for pushing boundaries. It's, it's never ending. There's so many things that we can do or want to do that it's just the endless search for the perfect bowl, even just a simple bowl. There's so many thousands of variations of a sing single bowl. So the constant urge for, and the search for that uh, eternal perfect bowl is constant. I guess, I guess on my part is because I'm, I'm, I'm quite narrow-minded before. I was super anti-glazes because I just really hated the shiny stuff. And this is because of my relation to my anagama kiln and it was more important to show the beauty of the clay body and this natural form and the natural fly ash melting onto the pots and 20 years later now i'm actually getting into glaze and you have to accept that you need to learn i'm going to be taking classes on glaze making because i mean there are beautiful glazes out there it's just really like john said it's so hard to put together a form and a glaze and it, you're only going to get this over trial and error. And yeah, you have to accept that it's always going to be, a, a, you're going to, there's so much to learn. You'll never learn everything in a lifetime with ceramics. Okay. Hi, good morning. This is from Len Valencia. I was one of the Petty John students back in 2005, and I want to go back to pottery. Where do I begin? I find it difficult finding supplies here in Cebu. Yes, Cebu. I don't think they have much supplies in Cebu. I guess they can they can order from Manila. There's some pottery, like Tahanan pottery and uh, pottery sessions. They have clay that they can sell. Also, central ceramics. And they have, you know, colors and I don't know if central ceramics glazes. But Tahanan pottery and pottery sessions, they have glazes also. Yeah, the best maybe, thing maybe. really, the best thing really to do is uh, look for a kiln, and then everything will follow after that. If you have a kiln, then the clay and the glazes and the the techno techniques will follow. Hi, Len from Cebu. Uh, tricky. I think maybe later it'd be a good idea because there's several Instagram uh, addresses like Pottery Session, Clay mm -hmm. Tourist. These are the suppliers available locally, and I think they do ship all over the Philippines. So we can maybe consolidate it. So at least the people outside of Manila will have the resource. Maybe you can um, post it on Jay Studios page later okay, today. So if you have it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that then, yeah. Okay, a question from Isabel Bag Bag Bagisi. Bagisi. 
while the process of forming the works are very personal, very individual, of course, there needs to be a chain that supplies the raw material and even the knowledge. How has that industry changed over the years and what you would be necessary for that industry to thrive in the Philippines? Do you think it's getting easier to access materials, equipment, training for future potters? I mean, you guys just said on Instagram, there are a lot of um, places where potters can get supplies now, correct? But anything else? Uh, when we, yes, before, before we used to get uh, materials from ceramic factories that were, you know, like clay and felspar, silica, all those things. And, but a lot of them closed up. Be, uh, because these this factories, they buy the whole like, you know, like the whole property that has clay and all those. So they, they so we just buy the finished products from, you know, the ground powdered Process. products processed from them. So uh, what's hard now is like to get a lot of these materials that are already processed, but we have so much materials in the Philippines, natural resources. But there are very few people, you know, like milling silica and felspar, because the ceramic industry in the Philippines uh, kind of has dwindled. But it, yeah. maybe it's resurging again. Yeah, because uh, you know, a lot of things, a lot of pottery from China, which are more, which are cheaper. <laughs> so the ceramic industry here closed. A lot of them closed up. So what we need is people to what we need are, pe are people to process materials. But there are materials out there. You just have to look around. You know, there are other industries that use the same, like the glass industry, use similar materials. Sometimes you can source things from them. Yeah. So for professional potters, uh, raw materials is an ingredient, uh, essential ingredient. But lately, because of the pandemic, uh, there's been local, locally available plays and kiln builders. So if you just you, you go to Instagram, you will be able to find clay glazes and kilns. So those are the basic things you can use to start a studio. What is lacking is the training, the, the teaching, the mentorship, the uh, yon, the the, the learning process, the education in how to fire, how to make proper wares the proper way. That I think is lacking in our present situation in the country right now. Yes, yesterday this question was asked also uh, and Ella and I answered that this is the time to start pottery. Why? Because if you had the budget in one week's time, you can put up a studio. You can order your kiln, you can order your glaze, you can order your clay. If you have the space, you're ready to go. Before, when I started, you had to build your own kiln. You had to make your own clay. You had to resource the raw materials to make your own glazes. So in a way, I, I was lucky and I'm happy that I went through that because it's like saying you throw me anywhere in the world and you have those raw materials, you can still make pottery. Okay, from Jared de Guzman. First, I would like to say hello to John, Tessie, and Joey for meeting you and visiting your studios this past months. Now, I know you had brilliant pottery students these past years, but would you like to mention past students that you felt have truly set their mark as a potter and why? Anybody you are proud to have mentored? John first. <laughs> oh no, I think they might have frozen. Joey, I think you have to. Oh, there they are. Uh, oh, jo oh, Joey, go. I've been yeah. teaching for almost 15 years. So, literally, I've had hundreds of students through all those years. And uh, just like the Petty Jans, we were hobbyists. So, I've got a lot of hobbyist students that uh, bought kilns, bought wheels, bike clay and throw at home. So it's really just a hobby, a weekender thing. But there are a few that have uh, made it, like in the recent show in J Studio, several of my students are joining. So 
maybe a lot of hobbyists pa rin, but transitioning into a professional potter, I'm not sure yet if there is still one that will that is there. Maybe they're still on the way from being a, a hobbyist into a potter. Maybe Nino Hernandez will uh, fit the bill because he's already an artist. Painter at that, musician, and now a potter. Okay. John and Tessie. I'm sorry, we missed the question. Oh, well, the question is really any any of your past students who even then you had you felt had the marks of being great potters, or any <laughs> or any particular students that you've um, you are proud to have mentored. Oh, there's some. There are too many to mention. <laughs> <laughs> We've had so many students. We have like, you know, professional ones now, like Joey and Adi Mendoza and Anton Kunying, but they're not in the country now. And they're, uh, you know, Rita Godino started a, uh, a pottery classes in UP. Yeah. Well, there were many who weren't really our students, but who passed through our schools at one, at one point or another. Yeah, there are just too many to mention. <laughs> it's very gratifying. Pablo, did you have you? Uh, I, 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 don't know they, I don't. I don't know if they would consider me as their teacher. But there was this special batch in UP about six, seven years ago, and there were a lot of them. There, there were kids back then, and they because this is what the, this was the time when UP started offering ceramic courses, and we would do workshops. And I did part-time teaching in UP before long time ago um, and I would work with Rita and we would do uh, wor um, workshops here in the farm also and we would, that these students would camp and do like overnight two nights and they uh, would talk about their techniques and workshops and, and now they're all exhibiting internationally traveling and mid party as a career so I'm so proud of them uh, that they <clears throat> have seen them as students and made a life like a career out of it. Oh yeah, one thing again, I forgot to mention. Yes, I was teaching in UP for nine years. And uh, like Marco, Ella, Krista, they were my students. So they were just, you know, little kids back then. And now they're exhibiting here with us. Yes. Yeah, really, uh, potters to be proud of. Okay, yes, um, we answered this. Good. Yeah, we answered this already. So, uh, are there any ceramic exhibitions this Art Fair 2022? Yes, in J Studio, definitely. And Joey is also in Avellana Art Gallery, right? Okay. Um, Sir John mentioned that pottery is an art that has been that has the most link to the past. A question to everyone: Having been in the industry for decades, what is your observation as to today's pottery scene? Do you have tips to ceramic artists of today on keeping the traditions of pottery that you have always known? Hmm. I mean, we all said the scene is more vibrant, for sure, than it was when John and Tessie were starting out. Um, you said you, you have a lot more venues and galleries that are open to showing pottery exhibitions, um, both fun your functional um, wear and like um, sculpt sculpted pieces, right? So. I think tricky, you know, it's the mindset that I, I'm uh, concerned about because because of information te technology, we're so used to pressing this button and we get everything. You know, it's instant, instant, instant. So, so people's mindset is when I want it, I have the resources, then I can get it and it will happen. With pottery, it can't be that way. You can't, that's why you know, the problem sometimes when people are interested in pottery, and unfortunately, the most pinaka fascinating is when people see a potter on the wheel. So the first instinct, anybody that comes here for a workshop, we want to go on the wheel. And I'm like, you're not getting on the wheel. We're doing basic hand building first. Because they think that once they get on the wheel, they can make something. But it's like the worst, worst uh, decision because it's also the turning point where they can hate pottery because they cannot... If you don't hold their hands and help them mold that piece of clay on the wheel, they will not be able to make anything. So it's kind of cheating in a way. Um, oh, my advice is just go to the National Museum, 
and see that famous burial jar, uh, see the collection from the Tabon Caves and look at the Chinese trade wares and you can get a whole education right there. Anything to add, Joey? Uh, I think lately Eskinita Gallery has invested in, uh, in young artists that are ceramists. So they, mm -hmm. they sponsor Oda and Ganyo and uh, she's been doing great sculptures. So I think uh, there are more galleries that are going into ceramics lately. Okay, when can you call yourself a potter from an anonymous attendee? <laughs> uh, we have to issue you an ID card. <laughs> <laughs> no ID, no entry. <laughs> <laughs> difficult, no. difficult. That's, that's a very good thing. I think maybe you should ask yourself that yourself yeah. that as a question. If you if you're doing pottery, are you happy with your work? Do you understand the process? Are you consistently making? You know, you ask yourself. Don't ask us. Don't ask anybody else. It's pottery is the it's a journey about you and clay. So you decide for yourself. Good morning from Jakarta, Antin Sambodo, who's also joined us for three days now. Hi, Hi. Joey, Hi. John, Jesse, and Pablo. Hi. Glad to see you all here. How to keep your good mood to do pottery every day? <laughs> By the way, I love your works, the shape, the texture, the glaze. <laughs> I guess we're always in the good mood. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's a lifestyle. Yeah, it's a lifestyle. It's yeah, definitely a lifestyle, and uh, me for me, I, I I stay away from the city. I just stay away from the city. A question for everyone: While making pottery, have you do you have a favorite memory from you know while you were creating something or making a particular piece that you will treasure your whole life? Well, there are those moments when you when you get into the zone. That, that's hard to explain, but you know, so, sometimes you're doing. Sometimes I'm doing something very simple, like I'm trimming some some tea bowls, and the and the light is a certain way, and the wind blows in a certain direction, and it just feels perfect. <laughs> and that's those are the moments. You know, I think I suspect those are the moments when good things come out, but I'm not so sure. <laughs> Uh, one memorable thing for me was when my dad passed away. I had an exhibition. I was working on the wheel. I had to mourn and throw at the same time. So tears, tears were rolling down, throwing, and then glazing with the with these initials. And uh, it was it was uh, emotional when you have a deadline and then. Something mm -hmm. like that tragic happens. So the emotions are transferred into the, the work itself. Uh, uh, for me, not about, well, I guess memorable, not about memorable, but about a dream of, I always tell John this, one day I'll be sitting in front of the wheel and I'm just making simple bowls for myself. And I don't have to think about anybody else or anything else. And I think that would be memorable. Have you ever experienced art block? I'm sure yes. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, what I do is I go to Pablo's farm. To <laughs> and then that's where I work. Yeah, we just definitely, don't. <laughs> definitely yes. But that, that's the beauty of the skill of uh, the potter's wheel, Tricky. Even if you have art block, you can still make something. So in a way, if you have art block, you take a rest, get detached from the studio, and then maybe a couple of days or a week later, you go back on the wheel and just make simple shapes. And maybe this will get you going again. How do you consistently get a good source of clay? Does the Philippines have good indigenous clay? And maybe you could say, if yes, where? Uh, yeah, we have a whole, we have really good clay, but it's very hard to get 
to it, like Kesson has beautiful clay, but it's high up on the mountain and it seems like people stop getting clay from there because um, the factories, the factories don't get clay from them anymore. But uh, there's like clay from Iloilo, clay from Quezon. I mean, Bukidnon. It's, Bukidnon. Okay. It's all really Ilo, all Ilo, over. Iloilo, there's lots of good clay. Yeah, it's really all over. It's just uh, very hard to get your hands on them. There's so clay from why... Sigada. There's clay yeah. from Sigada and Dumaguete, local porcelain, uh, sorry, local stoneware. There's excellent feldspar in Ilocos. Silica, Bicol, we have everything. Just we have everything here, yes. Even it's, for me, personally, even kaolin. Yeah, but as you mentioned, um, it's hard to get them. So that's why you resort to like, Joey importing. said, it's, yeah, to importing, yeah. Yeah. It's so hard in that you're dealing with different backyard family run businesses and that they're not really into mining but it's there in their backyard. So it's so hard to uh, group these uh, items together. So the best resort really is just to import ready to use materials. Uh, there's, there's yeah, two, difficult. There's two issues involved, Tricky. Yeah. There's sourcing and then after sourcing is processing. It takes a long time. And sometimes you'd just rather make a pot. So you just buy the clay. It's readily available. Yeah. Hopefully someday will some hopefully someday somebody will go into the business of uh, making clay processing. materials yeah. for local use. We still process some clay, like we you know we grind them in the corn grinder, we <laughs> sieve them, mix them, but it's you know it's very difficult to get to get clay nowadays. I think it's the same thing that the fabric um, industry has gone to like now that Habi, for instance, they're pushing for indigenous cotton. It's the same way, right? Yeah. You just, yeah. So it's really a problem for, I guess, those of us in the creative fields. Um, is financial capacity a requirement in getting into pottery? No, not really. <laughs> it's not a huge investment, I don't think. And then it doesn't take that much money to, it's like Pablo was saying, it doesn't take that much to get a workshop going. Yeah, but you know, but if you depend on it for your, you know, for your income, it will take a while, I guess, to... And it, to, it's also possible to make your own kilns and make your own equipment, save a lot of money. Um, uh, yeah. Go ahead. The, the income stream is so irregular as an artist in that, uh, you prepare now for two week, two months from now, then you submit deadlines. And then the collection is a month after those two months. And then it's a, it's a long drawn out process. So one cycle of one event will last three months. And if you don't have income for those three months, you won't make ends meet. So I've got pots in like Ayala Museum and uh, Philux Furniture. So those are long-term investments in that you consign in their galleries and then it'll take six months to a year to collect. So it's a long drawn out process. And that's why if you don't have that resources to tide you over, uh, then it's gonna be difficult. But uh, after a while, when you get the ball rolling, then it just falls into place. I think a good benchmark to get the ball rolling, like Joey said, it's gonna take like two years to really consistently have an income stream coming in. But you have to remember once you set up your studio, you still have to learn, you still have to practice, you still have to create. There's some, the, the process is quite tedious and long that you'll make mistakes and you're, you're, so it's not that you put up a studio and you're gonna earn money right away. Maybe the best is go to workshops first, study in studios and see, wait until you're happy with certain works and you can consistently make them and then decide to put up a studio. Because then when you have your studio, you know what to make already. Then maybe that will make the money, the financial issues easier. Yeah, to add to Pablo's uh, comment, uh, a lot of new potters are in the learning process and they're selling it outright. 
in that they're selling you their mistakes. So these beginning beginners are experimenting on you. You're buying their mistakes and uh, you have to love the craft, be passionate about it in that when you're learning, uh, make it a habit of, you know, learning from your mistakes instead of passing it off to your buyers, your customers, because there's a lot of buyers, a lot of people who, are, who demand pottery from artisans and then they'll lap it up. So pay your dues. Okay, we're actually out of time, but we'll finish all the questions. Um, the next few questions are all about your creative process. Paano kayo nagsisimula ng trabaho nyo? I mean, not your routine, but let's say you're preparing for a show. Let's say preparing for the, the art fair. I mean, what's the first thing you do? Make sure you have the, all the clay ma the materials. Make sure you have all the materials ready because you can't do anything if you don't have any clay, if you don't have your kiln set up, if you don't have the proper glaze. So there's a lot of preparation, Tricky, when you're going to have an exhibition. So you, you better make sure you have that. And if you have a proper studio, it's already naman in your schedule. Ne. And then if you do, if you're going to do wheel throwing, then you maybe sketch the shapes. And then if it's going to be a concept, with regards to sculpture, you have to break it down on how you're gonna put up the foundation and then how to come out with the shapes. You, Joey. Uh, I forget, what was the question again? Sorry. Um, how do you, how, paano kayo nagsisimula ng trabaho niyo? Ah, so, okay. It's more like, how do you prepare for an exhibition, let's say? Like, yeah, like at Fair Philippines, you have a concept, you have a deadline. So tall, the theme was bottles and vases. So tall pieces, minimum of 14 inches. So, so what type of tall, narrow vessel will come out? So it's just uh, by themes. I work by themes. So tall, narrow vases. The next theme, dinnerware. Next theme, wall pieces. Next theme, abstract sculptures. So it's always energizing to start a new project. It's just conceptualizing what you want to make. And it's usually not the same thing per project. Like for you, John and Tessie, what's the first thing you do when an exhibition is coming up? I just work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's never, never successful all the time. So I just keep making and making things. But that's, I don't, that's how I would do it. And then last minute, and then the last few days before the you know submission, that's when you get more ideas, and it's just a last minute thing <laughs> for me. Yeah, I think you know, in years ago, you could just have an exhibit. You you know, you just put a collection of your best work together, and you the title of the show would be recent work. <laughs> and those are great shows. I mean, and I wish I wish I, we could do more shows like that. But nowadays, it, you sort of have to have a concept a unifying concept of a body of work in a gallery. And that's a different challenge. It's a, it's a good challenge too. Okay, um, you've kind of touched this throughout this whole talk. What do you think is the enemy or struggles of beginners in pottery? I can hear already, Pablo, you have to master the basics first, right? You said that, yeah. Anything to add? <laughs> Not master, but yeah, make to talk the basics. Okay. I think patience. You just have to keep doing and doing it and doing it all the time and never give up. <laughs> yeah, we, we observed over the teaching so many years, some of the people that struggled the hardest actually turned out to be the, the better potters. You know, so talent, I don't think talent counts for much in, the, in what we do. <laughs> because sometimes because if it's too easy when you learn, then you sort of take it for granted. But the, we see people that really struggled to learn to throw. Like some people will learn to throw in a few months and other people will take years. So the struggle sometimes is very good. Anything to add, Joey? Uh, your worst enemy is yourself. So <laughs> if you, you're not into it, uh, it wasn't meant for you. If he doesn't like you, then you have to love it more than it loves you. So the pottery is really such a 
uh, a struggle in life. When you're not making functional works or are not bound by deadlines, do you have an idea on what you want to make or do you go with the flow? No, because Pablo says you have to do something every day. So when there are no exhibitions, there are no deadlines, what do you do? <laughs> uh, you do something that you love the most, which you don't often do. So I, that's when I get into sculptures. That's when I get into abstract forms. That's when I get into weird shapes. Uh, that's the freedom you you benefit, you earn from paying your dues in doing all this commitment with the galleries and commissioned works. That's your own work where you only answer to yourself. That's the best uh, freedom of uh, expression. It's the same thing for you, Pablo, right? That you said, when you have no deadlines, no nothing, and then... It, 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 yeah, no, if, I, if I don't want to think, I sit on the wheel and just make whatever shape comes out. No, nothing I don't think and then just play, play around like, no, I know, and just and see what shape comes out. That's the best. Yeah, what about for you, John and Tessie? When are you guys not busy? I don't think you guys, there's never a time when you guys are not busy, but just in case. Not lately, not lately no. <laughs> but yeah, I, no, I agree with, I agree with Pablo and John. Yeah, you just sit, you know, you just make whatever comes to your mind. No, no rush, no deadline. Just, just work. <laughs> okay, I think we answered this already. How long does it take for pottery to sustain your daily lifestyle? Joey said about two years, right? From setting up your own studio to, to it actually be self-sustaining. Okay, now it oh, are more, minimum two years, okay? Nowadays, pottery classes are booming, but it costs too much here in, in Metro Manila. You have an option to choose if you will pay for wheel throwing or pay for hand building. Which option should we beginners choose if we can't pay for both? Hand building. Yeah, I was going to say, I know another answer. After three days, yeah. I know another answer. You can <laughs> answer for us. <Astrid. laughs> you, can, you can make a lot of beautiful things with hand building. You don't need a wheel. Tricky, the most powerful tool in pottery are your hands. Okay. Do you think it's possible that there's going to be a conference on Philippine pottery in the future where you guys, as seasoned potters, will be mentors? Because yesterday it was, um, it, was it Krista who mentioned? Yes, the, Ella, Krista. It was Ella who mentioned the pottery, a ceramics conference happening. Is there going to be a ceramics conference in the Philippines? Something like that? Do you need it? I mean, it would be nice, but it's difficult because that's there's budget. It would be the number funding. one issue. Funding. We need funding. Yeah, before we, we were lucky. Before that, because John and Tessie spearheaded these conferences. Yeah, they're semi-retired. So. <laughs> so it's up to you guys to organize it now. UP has done a lot of things. Yeah, oh, UP yeah. Yeah, UP is doing a lot of things. Okay, well, good to hear. Any reference? Any references um, for learning more about pottery? Uh, you gave your the Instagram accounts that you're going to be listing, no, Pablo? Yes, yes. For the oh no, that's those are for the resources, the materials. Okay, I'm sorry. For learning, um, I think it was mentioned yesterday. You said actually, if you just Google on YouTube, there's a lot. Google and YouTube, everything's there. There's a lot. There's it's and it's free. Okay, our last question. What do you think should we work on locally, having been having with you guys having been around the world and seeing different pottery communities? What do we need to do here? Or if there's anything we need to do here to safeguard the value of the craft to properly introduce ceramics to a new crowd? Well, we're starting with this. This is it. Conversation. I was about, I was about to say Art in Philippines. No, actually, tricky. I came up, I came up with this idea because with the pandemic, uh, you know, we were all so stuck. But then it was starting to loosen up. And then I just took the opportunity and asked you if I could present this. So then at least we can get a jump start with pottery and get to reach out to the people out there who wants to learn or are learning. So thank you for this. And then Art in the Park next month. 
Yes, April 23. Oh my gosh. Okay, we have all we all have deadline, so much work to do. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you Pablo. It was a wonderful 3 days. Thank you John, Tessie, Joey because it's a wonderful ending to this um sessions. Um Pablo, is there anything you want to say before we close? Uh, up? Yeah. Yes, Lisa. Tricky, I just wanted to thank the people that were part of this whole project. Uh, so I want to thank Marco, Jessel, Krista, Ella, John, Joey, and Tessie uh, for doing this project. This, this was all out of their uh, busy schedules, and we were able to put it all together as a collaborative work, especially Marco, who did the film and editing. Thank you, Marco. Uh, and also, we'd like to thank galleries that we collaborated with, J Studio and Art Informal, for making this possible. And above all, this, thank you very much, Art Fair Philippines, for giving us the opportunity to share our love for our craft. Welcome, my gosh. Now you, you've added so much to the Art Fair. I mean, it was wonderful that our open studios this year really concentrated on um, your, your ceramic session. So thank you. Um, it was a great start to our talk series. And um, just to remind everybody, please, that you can still check out the works of our wonderful artists here at the Art Fair Philippines website. Before we go, can we just, I need to, we need to pose for a photo. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody has to see us pose for a photo. So Teresa or Danny, please count for us. Hi, good morning. So give us your biggest smile. Three, two, one, smile. One more. Three, two, one, smile. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So again, big thank you to J Studio for making this um, series of demonstrations possible. Thank you also to the education partners of Art Fair Philippines Talks Program, the Atene Art Gallery, Museum Foundation of the Philippines, Inc., and the Embassy of Spain in the Philippines. And we'd like to remind everyone there's a full day of talks uh, today over Zoom. The next talk is a talk in, co in collaboration with the British Council inside the mind of an art patron, the launch of their report on philanthropy in the Philippines, which is happening at four o'clock PM today. Please uh, tune into the daily at the fair section of the art fair website to see what else we have lined up for you until April 1. Thank you. <laughs>